In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's, um, it's always a little bit tricky for me to know what to tell you on um, Quinquagesima Sunday. I mean, we've got St. Paul's marvellous exposition of the most necessary virtue, which is charity. Uh, and in the gospel, we've got the cure of the blind man and the prediction of the passion. I say it's difficult because <laughs> it's not the, oh dear, there's not enough to talk about. Yeah, there's quite enough to talk about. Uh, all three things are important. Obviously, St. John points out that it's on our charity that we shall be judged at the end of our life, principally on our practice of charity. And since few really understand that, or indeed know what it entails, it would be very useful to hear about that again. I think I talked about it a couple of years back. Similarly, the uh, central position in the history of our salvation of the passion is possibly even less well understood, even it seems today, by the apostles. Now this uh, final reminder of the coming passion is very precise. Our Lord doesn't say to the general crowds who are following, presumably, up to Jerusalem. Uh, it's just the apostles. And you can imagine, if the apostles are disturbed by this prediction, what would have been the reaction of the general populace if he'd have told them? I mean, in fact, he has been telling them for some time, but in a very veiled way. What else does that phrase mean which is thrown back in his face at his sham trial before the Sanhedrin? Destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. But it's important that he tells the apostles very clearly because whereas the people would remember the vague prophecies after the event, once they see what has happened i.e. that he is handed over to the Gentiles and mocked and scourged and crucified uh, and then ri rises again on the third day. Once they've seen that, then they can see uh, oh, what he meant by those prophecies. But it's important for the apostles to know exactly what's going forth. You see, the people will see from this that um, he went forth to meet his death not in ignorance of what it implied, or by compulsion, but knowingly and willingly. Uh, the reason why I need to tell the apostles uh, is that they need to face the coming passion with great courage uh, and not to be entirely overwhelmed by coming upon it unexpectedly. And that's why, I suppose, he goes into all the grisly details about it. Um, not that he's going to be rejected by the religious leaders of the chosen people, because they could have foreseen that anyway. They've seen how the Pharisees behave in Jerusalem. But then that they would hand him over to the Gentiles, which I suppose indirectly is Herod, but principally, of course, the Romans, the Roman occupiers, and that he would be mocked. <laughs> the Messiah would be mocked and scourged by the Gentiles. Well, they couldn't have foreseen that. And it's important, after the years now of showing them his power, that they don't just hear the good news joyful tidings of his final triumph. But they must also see 
what it is going to involve. People like good news, but they're not very keen on sad news, even if it's true. And, and that's why I think he didn't tell them right at the beginning when he called them, in case they would be frightened. And he didn't wait until the time itself when they would probably be confused. So he must tell them now. After the years of teaching of eternal life and the proof of the same by his wonderful miracles, and they'd seen him raise people from the dead, seen him raise Lazarus, um, but they knew, of course, from the scriptures that prophets had done that um, in the Old Testament. But that he should be able to raise himself from the dead, that was beyond them. They couldn't see how that was going to happen. And also, of course, <laughs> It seems that they didn't understand the truth that once he was alive again, he would no longer die. Because the other people who were raised from the dead did die again, eventually. Lazarus or uh, the widow's son from Naim. So they get this very clear prediction of the circumstances of his passion. And... And they understood none of these things. And this word was hid from them. And they understood not the things that were said. Or as it says in uh, St. Mark's Gospel, and they were dismayed. And those who followed were afraid. Well, um, it's easy enough to reproach the apostles for their lack of understanding, particularly when we've got this blind man in the miracle that follows it, who understands perfectly well um, who he's dealing with. But we have to be careful because we're just the same, really. We're dismayed when we hear that we have to do penance and we're afraid when we hear we have to give up some of our comforts. We shrink from fasting and we make excuses to carry on as we are. I was mentioning last week, weren't I, about Pilgrim's Progress and how pliable is really enthusiastic about eternal life and every tear being wiped away the good news but he doesn't want to do what is necessary to obtain those things and actually after this passage it gets even worse it gets worse the mother of James and John comes up to our Lord and obviously she's understood uh, if she heard it uh, as little of what our Lord's just said as, as the apostles themselves so she asks our Lord then, immediately after this, for honours, special honours for her two lads in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Messiah. Honours, yes. Position, yes. Privilege, yes. What about drinking our Lord's chalice and following him in his passion? Well, to be fair, the two apostles do say yes to that too. Although James is not standing next to his brother at the foot of the cross. But this is the apostles before the passion, uh, before the resurrection, and uh, before the coming of the Holy Ghost. I think our position is, is slightly... Well, it's better and it's worse if we don't do as we're told. It's better in that we've seen all these things. We know about the resurrection. Uh, we know about uh, the necessity of the passion. And we have had that preached to us for years and years and years. We know all those things. But they didn't know that. 
They were hearing it all for the first time. And I mean, if you look at the, the language our Lord uses, it's not harsh or condemnatory. It doesn't say, uh, can you endure slaughter? Are you prepared to shed your blood? He says, are you willing to drink the same chalice that I drink? So he is pointing out that whereas they're already interested in honours, he's talking about the Christian life being one of struggle and wars and dangers and of the sweat of toil. There's that funny passage in the book of the Apocalypse where it says... Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Which is as much to say that in the last times, at least, is what the apocalypse is about, isn't it? In the last times, the good are exhorted. I'm sure that's a subjunctive of exhortation with regard to the good. Um, whereas it's, it's a subjunctive of allowance, I suppose we'd call it, for the evil. Well, let them do that. Let them carry on doing that. What's going to happen? Um, whereas for the good, it's actually not just to let them do it. It's, it's they ought to do it. They should be doing these things. So the good exhorted to persevere despite everything, even amidst all the desolation. But on the other side, um, the evil go on doing evil because there's no understanding the lascivious wallow in their impurities, and there's no sign of conversion there at all. People, in the last times at least, will remain blind and will not see. Well, I don't know if we're in the last times or the beginning of the last times, uh, but it's certainly a very preoccupying time. And as we saw last week, the whole problem of our Lord's teaching is that much of it is given in parables. And um, if you speak in parables, as our Lord himself says, those who don't want to see, won't see. Whether it's the uh, degrees of commitment to working in the vineyard, which we had in Septuagesima, or the various things which keep the generality of mankind from attaining heaven using the image of a field, which was last week's gospel. There's always the danger that some people, many people, most people, won't see. Or they can't see. They will assume, I suppose, <laughs> if they go to church at all, that they are the good workers in the vineyard. They're the good ones. And that they're the ones who are bringing forth fruit a hundredfold. So, the important thing about today is, and this is just before the start of Lent, it's not a parable. This is not a parable. This is something that our Lord said. So, all we've got is our Lord's words, his clear and unambiguous words, and the cross. I wonder what it was warning against, actually, because obviously there is an explanation, and that's the whole sort of homiletic nature of a sermon, or at least part of it, uh, that you explain to them what's going on and why it's going on, and, and, and that sort of stuff. But what is, what is it getting at here? Uh... And I'm sure 
If the people who reject him do so for a reason, then that might be the reason why we are not going to have a good Lent. Um, and that would make then this Sunday's gospel, and I suppose to an extent the epistle, a warning against pride. Because of pride, we are subject to grief and death. We live in pain and suffering. Because of it, we have to endure labours and live by the sweat of our brow in afflictions without end, as St John Chrysostom says. Yeah, what is the sin of Adam other than pride? Ultimately, the devil says to him, you will be like God. You will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. <laughs> but they already knew good. They knew good. They lived in a garden of delights. They conversed personally with God himself. They knew good. Why would they want to know evil? Well, that's the nature of pride, isn't it, really? They lost everything. They lost it. All the preternatural gifts that they'd been given, gone. They then had to die and to suffer because of pride. And, and, and pride always has that effect. It, it, it adds nothing to our life. But it also takes away from us much of what we have. Well, is there a remedy for pride? There is. And it is penance. And the time of penance begins on Wednesday. Penance, fasting, assiduous prayer, that's the authentic teaching of Christ. The modern church, not that you people go, at least not normally, but the modern church has abandoned all that. It's abandoned fasting, it's abandoned abstinence, it's abandoned uh, ember days, and so on. And, and the idea, I think, in today's modern world of physical penance, actually doing physical penances, is considered to be slightly weird. Weirdos do that sort of thing. The idea of having physical, I don't know, in the mid Middle Ages, they used to wear chains around their waist, you know, heavy chains, which would be uncomfortable. That seems perverse to the modern man. Why would they do that or wear a hair shirt which is scratchy and itchy? To do it deliberately, not to sort of just put on a nice clean shirt and it's all been starched and everything and the neck is itching like mad the whole day. Uh, but to do it deliberately, those sort of things seem quite weird to people nowadays. And certainly I think, oh, it's fair enough to say, to people in the modern church. Sure, they think those sort of things are weird. If they knew that you people were going to be doing serious physical penances, they think, what a bunch of weirdos they are in tradition. Maur is maur. Yeah, well, we've seen 60 years of the fruits of that, the fruits of abandoning what the church has taught for 2,000 years. We've seen the fruits of it. We know where it leads. We're not weirdos. We're just thinking, hmm, well, this is what happens if you don't do these things, and we don't want that to happen to us. So we're going to do it, whether it's weird or not. That's because our Lord says so. And we're listening to him, not what the present thing is. The current narrative, we're not following that. Um, otherwise, basically, it's, it's the wholesale abandoning of the faith, isn't it? That's what's happened. Well, we haven't given up these things, or at least we shouldn't have done. I mean, what would be the point 
of going to the traditional mass. If as soon as you leave the church, you just live like Novus Ordo Catholics anyway. Well, you go along to a uh, a traditional mass, but your life is completely Novus Ordo. No penance, no fasting, no assiduous prayer, nothing. So if you want to live the rest of your life as Novus Catholic, Novus Ordo Catholic, there are churches enough in Edinburgh, which you can go to, or on the telly if you're watching it at home. But you don't go. So I'm assuming that you want to do what our Lord says. And he says that Lent is coming. I mean, (laughs) you know the rules. Uh, You know when they were changed. Perhaps you don't know when they were changed. It was 1966 with Painatamini by Paul VI. Basically said, yes, we've got 2,000 years of this and now we've reached the 20th century and it is time to abandon it. So he chopped out this and that and the other and all went. So um, within living memory, though, before that, I mean, fasting was extremely strict during Lent. And abstinence was a serious thing. So it's up to you now to do these things. After a long and solemn blessing, the ashes will be imposed on your heads, on your forehead, normally. The clergy have it on their tonsure. There's a little bald bit on the top of your head. My bald bit is quite big, actually, (laughs) so I can positively cover it with ashes. But because normally the laity don't shave the tops of their heads, uh, I put it on your forehead um, on Wednesday. I mean, ultimately, everyone can receive them. I should really be saying to you now, make sure you all come and receive the ashes but, uh, I mean, I talk about Holy Communion like that. Of course, I can't exhort you all to come because if you're living in mortal sin, you can't. That's just against the rules of the church. Can you receive a sacramentally mortal sin? Well, I think people can see clearly there is no point imposing ashes on infants. They have no idea what's happening to them. There is no will involved. There is no understanding involved. And they have no sins. They've been baptised. It makes no sense whatever. I mean, everyone can see that. But the idea of someone... (laughs) Why do you put these ashes on your forehead if it is not to show your disposition of repentance? If you're living in mortal sin, there is no disposition of repentance because you're not getting out of it. I mean, people, if people want to come up because of their mortal sin and think it will help them in some way, I mean, I'm not going to deny it, but it does seem very, very odd. I mean, you get that strange gospel on Ash Wednesday about our Lord saying, when you fast, when you do penance, don't let anyone know. And here we are, <laughs> smearing crosses on your forehead so everyone can see. Well, that's, uh, well, that's a mystery that we can go into on Wednesday in the sermon then. But <laughs> it certainly would be a very bizarre thing if you get the smearing, and I give nice, I've got huge thumbs, I give nice big crosses on Ash Wednesday. But if you get it, and then there is no repentance, no fasting, no abstinence, nothing. That is just pure hypocrisy and humbug. No. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. The ashes are supposed to be a sacramental sign of our resolve to do serious penance this Lent. I mean, it is true that without grace, by our own efforts, we can do nothing. Our Lord said that. We can't even see how bad we are and what we need to do. But... <laughs> We are going to get the grace. So we need to make the efforts. 
And I think that's why we've got this, this, this gospel of the blind man. Because perhaps you don't believe me. Perhaps you think, oh no, he's making this bit up now about doing penance and stuff. <laughs> Your prayer today should be, Lord, that I may see. Let me see this. Let me understand this. The importance of it. The necessity of it. So the ashes should be a prayer that we receive God's grace this Lent and that we work with it to produce fruit that will last. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.